Mike, tell me about your mum, Rosemary Chickwork. Is, is she still with us? How is she? And a bit about her story getting into Scientology. Absolutely. Um, so she's doing quite well. Um, she is with us. She's actually uh, free. She has freedom of religion, freedom from religion. Uh, she's living with me in uh, the United States. Uh, we're uh, here in Pennsylvania, and uh, we were able to help her escape. Uh, going on about 18, 19 months ago um, from a, quite a story getting her out of the Sea Organization in Los Angeles. So she is doing quite well. Um, she has good medical care now, but she is uh, she's quite old. Uh, she's an, eh, not, not too terribly old, but her um, she had a lot of unhandled medical conditions from being a Sea Org member for uh, 35 years. Then now we're trying to catch up on those things. And there's, you know, there's just some things at a certain point in a person's life you can't really fix. But she is doing very well. She's probably in the best place that she's ever been um, since she's been alive, which is wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah, it's not mm. often that somebody has a triple bypass heart surgery and more than a decade later is doing much better than they've ever done. So, you know, kudos to her. And what a, what a great situation that is. But the story that I've read about now, and you gave me lots of information about it, is just one of the most gruesome stories and, and, and a perfect example of what cults and Scientology in particular do to people. And I think we'll we'll get it out bit by bit because there is so much to this. Um, but firstly, so in Scientology, I imagine she was quite far up, was she? Was she high up? Uh, she was. Um, I mean, I, I guess I could uh, give a little backstory on how we end, even ended up there, but she ended up at uh, some of the highest levels that you could even expect to get to um, in terms of administratively working in the church, in terms of receiving uh, their so-called benefits of what they'd like to provide. Uh, after working for 35 years, she ended up no further along than when she started. But when when we got into Scientology, I was um, I was probably about seven years old. It was before my parents ended up getting divorced. Uh, we lived in Colorado. And the um, it wasn't a great home situation. Um, I have a very controlling um, a father who, uh, reminiscing back now with mom, it's very uh, clear that even the uh, relationship we were in before had a lot of um, similarities to a cult. And uh, in if people have done any research on cult dynamics, you'll find that you can have them of all shapes and sizes to include families. But my father was somebody who had struggled very much with uh, PTSD after he was in the military in Vietnam and was a very over-controlling spouse and ended up leaving us when I was around the age of 10. Um, at that time, he had kind of gone from self-help um, regimen to self-help regimen, and we ended up uh, just in the Scientology bubble around the point that he left my mother. So she was trying to figure out kind of to find her way as a single mother and thought that she very much was getting involved in a church organization. It was funny. She there was kind of a she had a, a point to go kind of towards this Christianity path and then towards the Scientology path. She picked the wrong road. <laughs> yeah. And we ended up in Scientology. Wow. Is that so interesting that it was seen? I think a lot of people don't understand what Scientology is, and it was seen as basically uh, an alternative to Christianity then. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, it's it's very different. But uh, the way it was kind of marketed to them when they got involved, my parents and I was quite young at the time. So, you know, as a kid, you kind of just go along with whatever your parents do. But it was marketed to them as a self help um, process. Um, and my father was looking for it for relief from things like PTSD and anger issues and things of this nature. And my mother was uh, kind of just following along with him. And um, she went from kind of having what was a 20 year marriage to then being a single mom almost overnight and then trying to figure out what to do. And, uh, one thing that Scientology is very good at is recruiting people, um, and, you know, getting them in there, starting to be control their, you know, behavior and what they're doing. Um, and when a person is in a vulnerable spot, it's very easy to get them in. And that's what happened yeah. to her. And this was uh, as a civilian Scientologist uh, when, sh when we were in Denver. It's before the Sea Organization was even an option. Um, some, some time into uh, when she was there, probably within about a year after my parents were going through um, getting separated and getting a divorce, she got recruited for the C organization, and that is the upper level management organization that's kind of the fellowship arm of 
Scientology that controls ecclesiastically all of the lower organizations. It, if you would look for a parallel, I would probably say it would be very similar to the Vatican um, in the way that they have the Catholic Church has all the separate uh, lower um, parishes and churches. Um, but that is what the C organization is up to its highest level. So she was recruited into that and within a matter of months, sold all of our belongings or gave them away and then moved out there from very much a suburban living um, situation to now what was living with just the cl few clothes that we brought with us out to Los Angeles. And, um, you know, pr in very short order, once she went through their kind of boot camp situation, she was assigned um, as a new staff member in their marketing organization. This is the organization that was referred to as Central Marketing Unit. Um, it was headed up by the leader's brother. Uh, David Miscavige is a leader of Scientology, and his brother at that time, um, Ronnie Miscavige, was the head of the Central Marketing Unit. This, this is right around the era where all the big Dianetics campaign was huge, and they were trying to get you know the Dianetics race cars and all this stuff happening back in the, the late 80s. And um, so during that time, my mother quickly became uh, Ronnie's, this is Ronnie Miscavige Jr. There's Ronnie Miscavige Sr. passed away some, uh, uh, some short time ago, but um, Jr. is who she was uh, working for. And she was his secretary and uh, kind of stayed with him working in that organization for about a decade uh, through um, the uh, different marketing um, levels that he moved up to, you know, the, the, the original organization in Los Angeles quickly moved up to their secret location in Gilman Hot Springs, and he was promoted to a more executive marketing um, position and kind of took uh, my mother Rosemary along with him. I've been saying to you that I have a biased view. I'm Jewish. I've grown up around that culture. I'm worried for the lives of my family and friends. And so for a complete picture, you need to view other sources and see both sides. So I want to tell you about my sponsor, Ground News. I really like this sponsor. It's a great match because it's an app and website created by a former NASA engineer to give readers a transparent, data-driven way to read the news. Let's take a look at one of the stories on the Ground News website. Here it has... Israel says it killed one of the architects of the October 7th attack. That was the attack by Hamas. And as you scroll down, you can see there is significantly more coverage from the right. The left are largely ignoring this. So it tends to be center and center right publications that want to show that Israel is actually aiming for Hamas terrorists. It seems like maybe on the left, they want to show that they are aiming for civilians. So that's one example of the kind of bias that you get that Ground News is fantastic at pointing out. I really like this, the blind spot feature. So if you are on the left, left, you can look at all these reports that are only being reported by the right. If you're on the right, you can look at stuff that is only being reported by the left. Get access to important features such as the blind spot feature to see what isn't being covered by subscribing to their Vantage plan. To get 30% off, use my link, that's ground.news slash Andrew Gold. By doing so, you're supporting my channel and getting the full picture on every story. Right. So for those who don't know, L. Ron Hubbard was the founder of Scientology and a, and a prolific sci-fi writer. I think he held, holds the world record for the most uh, science fiction books ever written. He died in 1986, even though he was supposed to live forever. And David Miscavige then grasped the power, I think, quite aggressively. And so at this point, when your mum was working for under, working under Ron Miscavige, Ronnie Miscavige, uh, w was David in charge at that point? Was Ronnie the brother of the leader? Yes, he was. So this is already after um, the, I guess, the power grab, or he had moved into the position of um, taking control of Scientology. That had already happened um, prior to us arriving in Los Angeles. Um, mm. So the 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 organizational structure was now such that David Miscavige was in full control of it, and over the the next several decades, that just solidified deeper and deeper. But as such, Ronnie. Um, was a very senior executive, uh, not only by the assignment, but there was also, uh, I would say, a degree of um, privilege that he had for being the leader's brother, um, not only in his position in the church, but also just being a Miscavige. It was arguably the most important name next to Hubbard. And even today, I would say, is probably a lot of Scientologists see Miscavige as even more important than Hubbard. So this was at the time when that was already kind of coming into uh, fruition, I think, for him. 
We often hear, obviously, about David Miscavige, who does go around, according to ex-Scientologists like Mike Rinder in his book, uh, just punching people in the face if he's in a bad mood, throwing people into something called the hole uh, and making them admit to things that they didn't do before letting them out after days and days of of that kind of horrible torture. Uh, So by all accounts, not a very nice person. What we, I haven't heard much about Ronnie, his brother. So tell me a bit about his character. Um, uh, this is kind of a double-edged sort of a conversation. And I'll kind of explain why. Ronnie, mm. um, outwardly, and the way he dealt with people, from my observation, was a much kinder, general, in, uh, gentler individual. He um, was not nearly as uh, openly uh, abusive, although I did experience uh, or a witness when I was a young child him uh, that another Sea Org member had uh, angered him and myself and some other kids saw him actually attack this other Sea Org member. It was a gentleman by the name of Bill Dendu who was uh, his second in command for the marketing area. And um, it was after Bill had tried to escape, they had captured him back. And from my understanding, Ronnie uh, was told by his brother David, go out there and you know beat up Bill. So it was out at the location where the kids were being kept um, a short distance away from their international base. And myself and uh, Ronnie's children, who um, are my best friends and, uh, you know, the close were very close as we were growing up. We were there in this area and he comes rolling up and just attacks Bill. And uh, it was startling. But from my understanding, that that was that was not typical for Ronnie. But that was the first time I actually saw physical violence of that nature, like a man physically assaulting another man was Ronnie Miscavige uh, attacking Bill Dendu after Bill Dendu had, you know, blown, which is the Scientology word from escaped. And they had ca- they had gotten him back and he was kept out at this location where the children were. And Ronnie came out to confront him. And then Bill ended up blowing again after that big, big surprise. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but aside from that, Ronnie much he seemed much more of a uh, a kind person. He he had children. Um, he seemed to be focused as a father, at least to the to the degree that a Sea Org member could be, um, and was much more approachable than his brother Dave. Everyone was, I would say, terrified at all times of David Miscavige. Like when you heard this individual coming around. Um, it wasn't you, you would think that a church leader, when the person comes around, people would want to experience that. Um, I would say that most people were intimidated at the thought of him coming around just because of what would happen when he did. If anything wasn't just perfect, it would result in um, that person, you know, getting the brunt of whatever his wrath was at that point. So I didn't enjoy working around him or with him at all. That's David. Ronnie was a little bit nicer. It's amazing, isn't it? I, I, I find it incredible that how closely Scientology as a cult and other cults follow authoritarian um, countries, regimes, where mm-hmm. so often the person who started the, the cult or the authoritarian regime is bad. And everyone, people can't wait for them to die because they might not be able to have the same control. You know, maybe people will be free. And then the person who comes in their place is even worse because it's the one person in that organization that's already fostered this kind of cultish uh, attitude has already rewarded people for being that way and he's the guy at the top who really grabbed the power and it's just like yeah authoritarian countries and regimes and things um so your mother was working directly with ronnie and well what was he getting up to what was he doing and and how did you find out about this so um Apparently, this we found out about much, much later, but um, apparently from the very beginning of when Rosemary started working for Ronnie, he started grooming her slowly to kind of get um, what would be, you know, sexual favors, Um, not not to the full extent what that might be, but it started out as back rubs and then he would uh, have her giving him massages and it ended up him, you know, exposing himself to her and putting her in a very weird situation um, where she, if, if you know anything about Scientology, there's no such thing and there's no mechanism in place for workplace violence or anything of this nature for a person to be able to report it and not have retribution as a result. So in in not only is he a miscavige and he's almost above the law, but if somebody is a victim of that and they want to report such a thing, they will be investigated for what they did in order to uh, have that happen to them. So 10 years this was going on with Ronnie, 
And, um, and it was kept, uh, like my mother had no idea what to do with it. She just knew that she had no money, had no other resources. She was working for this organization around the clock, had been there now for the better part of a decade. And what is she to do? So the, what actually, um, transpired was Ronnie, I guess, had not been getting some stuff done that his brother David wanted done with marketing and started being investigated by the Religious Technology Center. Um, Marty Rathbun and some other investigators were involved in this at the time, and they found out that Ronnie was doing this through his confessionals that Scientology administers on that uh, the e-meter, which is kind of their lie detector. These confessionals are very much interrogations. They use they use flashy church lingo like confessionals and um, things that sound more ecclesiastical than they really are. But what these are is just straight up interrogations. They're very, uh, very isolating, um, very introverting. They're, they're not fun to go through. I've been through several. But through this, they found out that Ronnie had been engaged in uh, very much quid pro quo sexual things with Rosemary. And when RTC, that is the Religious Technology Center, this is the head of Scientology, the organization that David Miscavige is the leader of. When they found out about this, you would think that they would do something in order to fix it. Well, what they did is they then interrogated Rosemary. They interrogated Rosemary and then she was removed from her position. Ronnie was sent back to his position to work and she was isolated and made to do heavy manual labor and ultimately was, you know, moved to another position uh, in a lower organization just to do like um, housekeeping um, for the years uh, following that for about four years. So that that is the um, hypocrisy in, you know, this this head organization that's one of their main functions is to police Scientology to make sure that it is doing what it's supposed to do. And this sort of behavior is not acceptable in any, um, in any form, in any way, but it's not also acceptable in Scientology. But because this was Ronnie Miscavige, David's mm -hmm. brother, you know, the blame was placed on the victim and it's just yet another example of their hypocrisy that, that occurs in that organization. So um, during that time, I think Ronnie and his wife were separated. She was working in a different location and they had always had a marriage where they were geographically separated from one another. And I'm not trying to make excuses for Ronnie, but um, given the situation that he had in his marriage, I think that's, he was going outside of the marriage and in such a way was assaulting my mother as a result of it. So um, a year or two passes and then Ronnie and his wife then decide to leave the Sea Org and they do. And a lot of this, if anyone's familiar with uh, Jenna Miscavige uh, Hill, uh, she wrote a book which is called Beyond Belief, um, where she kind of details a lot of her childhood uh, to include when she was trying to leave and her parents had left. Well, Jenna is Ronnie's uh, daughter and somebody that I grew up with and I'm very close friends with and her, her, her big brother is actually my best friend, uh, Justin oh. and Sterling. Oh, yeah, both nice. of them are. Yeah, so there, we're, it's all, uh, I kind of, I, I use the analogy uh, that the, the family tree in Scientology is very similar to a Game of Thrones, that uh, TV mm -hmm. series on HBO, where everything's kind of like, you know, a little bit inbred and backwards and all that. And that's very much what mm -hmm. it's like. And then I'm sort of like royalty adjacent is what I refer to myself <laughs> as. So I'm kind of the Hodor character, I would guess. In that whole right. situation. I, I've never seen Game of I must be the only person who hasn't seen it, but everyone has seen it. But I, I think I think you could just say the monarchy, basically. It's the same thing. Yeah, very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that um, sometimes you refer, you refer to your mum as, as mother and sometimes as, as Rosemary. Is that sometimes, is it, is it because it's um, hard to talk about? Is it hard to think about what Scientology let happen to your mum? Um. It is. It's hard to talk about this, but I think it's important that I share it. But I'd also like to kind of draw a culty parallel between the way that Sea Org members deal with each other. And from a very young age, um, when I was brought out to the Sea Organization and I worked in the similar locations to my mother and uh, the family dynamic of mother, son, um, and any family dynamics like that are very much stripped away and you're, you're almost like a very militaristic type of organization. The entire time that I worked with her and around her, um, it was discouraged for people to refer to one another, even if they were, you know, these family relationships of, you know, father, son, mother, daughter, 
people wouldn't do that. So whenever I would refer to her, even in that organization, it was Rosemary. And what's funny is now that I've gotten her out and I've helped with a lot of her medical needs and I talk to her doctors, you know, I refer to her as Rosemary and her, the doctor's like, I noticed you refer to your mom as Rosemary a lot. That's really strange. And it is, but that's kind of the way that Scientology, um, I guess, programmed our relationship. Now, when we're together, it's, it's, you know, it's, I call her mom and, um, it's very normal, but when I'm talking about her, um, it feels more strange to say mom than it does to call her by her name. And I know that societally that is probably odd, but that was the, the majority of our life together, that was the way we referred to one another was Michael and and Rosemary, you know, kind of referring to almost each other as business associates. Wow. Just, just, it's incredible. It's incredible what they do, the way they strip away the family unit, the way they strip away uh, love, I think. And so, so that people, I guess, are, are quicker to be able to disown one another uh, in, in the name of the cult. Um, if you had discovered your, that that was happening to your mum at the time, would well, I, I'm wondering now, because of the distance that's been created, would, would you have wanted to attack him and kill him? Like what would happen in, in a movie, I suppose? Or would you, what can you do? So um, I have to look through that, uh, give you an answer through two different lenses. There's obviously the lens of um, me, who I am today, and the way that I would react to that, which would be very different from the, the, uh, the lens that I would look through it at the time, because I was at that base at the time. And though I didn't understand fully what happened, we were informed that my mother had had some sort of uh, inappropriate relations with her boss. And that's all I really knew about it. And Scientologists and Sea Org members are uh, not really allowed to talk about details of things that happen. Whatever the organization tells you is what you go with. So, and that, that also goes for if somebody is dis, you know, they have discontent with the organization and they want to leave. You're not allowed to talk about leaving. If you ever want to leave, you're not allowed to share that with, with even with your spouse. So um, at the time, I thought that she had transgressed and he had transgressed. And um, I thought that it was odd that he was sent back to his position and that she was then the one in trouble. But I wasn't in any sort of position to do anything about it. Um, nor do I know that I was in the right mindset at the time to see it uh, as horrible as it was and to be able to talk to her about it for her to confide in me it was all done through the um, the ethics and justice arms of the organization and no one is supposed to speak of it it's whatever they deem as the the results of that is kind of what goes and anything else is to be disregarded and you know you don't you don't handle things individually it's all just done through the organization you you escaped in 2003 20 years ago as of last month um, congratulations yes. Thank you. Um, Scientology went in at that time and burnt your mum's photos of you. I mean, what does that make you think to think back at that time? And how, how was that for her? Um, so when I, I blew in um, October of 2003, around that same time, I think, is when Ronnie and his wife ended up uh, escaping or leaving. And uh, shortly after that, they had done a big cleanup to get rid of people from the international base. In 2004, she was sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force. And then, as you said, like they took all of her personal belongings and family photos and burnt them in front of her. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, looking back on that, the what what appeared to happen is once Ronnie was gone out of the organization, it's almost like they were cleaning up the details uh, related to him and then they were getting rid of her. So he was no longer there working as an executive. So now it was time to just throw her out. And they did along with a lot of other people at the time, but she was almost like tossed out, tossed out like garbage and sent to their thought re uh, reconditioning camp, which is the rehabilitation project force in Los Angeles, where she spent the next six years. And, and, and uh, I was, and I'd referenced a lot of this in some of my videos because I've started my own channel just to kind of encapsulate all of what's happened to her. And um, I had one of my friends at work mentioned that he's like, hey, you throw out some interesting details like she had gone to the Re rehabilitation project force for six years. He's like, six years is a really long time. Like what happened in those six years? <laughs> and um, factually, we're still trying to piece all that together because um, 
it's almost like Groundhog Day every day while they're just like living in complete squalor. Uh, all of their time, their thoughts and everything is completely controlled. And uh, she was on that program until she um, was 65 years old, at which point she, they finally let her off of it. What a, a horrific thought and a horrific thought to think that there are people right now, you know, men, women, young people, old people who are in these horrible rehabilitation programs, which are pretty much like prison. Uh, this is just absolutely mad. Um, and was that was that very difficult for your mum then? Because I, g I gather she was a firm believer in this stuff. And that's the worst part of this. You must feel that you've done something really wrong. Um, she was a firm believer. She, at this point, had been working uh, in this organization for a decade and a half. She had no money. She had no access to the outside world. She very rarely, if ever, would even talk to, let alone visit um, her family, of which she, she has nine brothers and sisters and a very large family in Ohio. And she had fallen out of contact with all of them. So she was very beholden to this organization. And whatever they said, they they like hold, held the keys to her future. And she was also in the mindset of everything she had done wrong. Um, like she was responsible for what happened with the situation with Ronnie Miscavige. And in the entire time that she had worked in this for this organization, the only thing that they could find that she did wrong was what he did when he attacked her and did those things to, you know, put her in that situation. So she's like, they were almost looking for like, we need to get rid of her. What are we going to do about this? And that that's where she was left. And um, yeah, they made her at, she kept the same last name as mine, Brown, for that entire time. Um, not because she uh, wanted to remember my father, but because she had a connection to me. But when she was on that rehabilitation project force, just one example of, her and any other woman that was had kept a maiden name or something that was connected to what they consider a suppressive person, they were made to change their names. Um, oh, they, they brought in the paperwork, they had them fill it out, and they were made to change their names back to their maiden names. And it's disgusting. Uh, yeah, it's, this is just an example of the, the absolute um, behavior control that they're instituting on people, controlling their thoughts, telling them what they can and can't think. This is what they endured. During that time, were you able to have any contact with her? And you were coming to grips, obviously, with being on the outside. Uh, were you sad not being able to be with her? So as soon as I had blown, which is their, their departure to leave and to escape, um, I was disconnected from. Um, she wasn't allowed to talk to me. I had kind of found out from somebody who had escaped some months later that she was sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force. I kind of figured out where she was. Um, when I left, I, uh, was married at that time to, um, a girl who was David Miscavige's makeup artist and her father previously to that, um, my, my ex-wife, Samantha was uh, John Travolta's auditor. So it's a family that's very deeply connected into Scientology. And when, uh, we had gone through a lot in our marriage, um, she had gotten pregnant twice and was put in the situation of having to terminate the pregnancies in order to stay on staff or we would be kicked out. Um, we had gone through all of that and uh, I had lost contact with all of when I finally decided that I had to leave and the straw that broke the camel's back is probably a whole nother conversation for me on what made me leave. Um, but it had a lot to do with Dave Miscavige, the abuse, uh, him physically threatening me, um, being abusive to my ex-wife verbally threatening her. And then when I was like, let's just get out of here, let's just blow, she was so indoctrinated and her family was so um, deeply rooted into Scientology that she said if we leave, she would just want to come back uh, at that point. Uh, and she was like, I would just want to come back and we're, we would end up divorced. And that was a very different reality than what mine was. And that was kind of the, the, light, the light switch went off at that point. And I was like, okay, I this is... I have to leave. I'm miserable here. I'm, and I just, and I escaped. Wow. So I didn't have access to my ex-wife, uh, still wife at the time. Uh, we, I wasn't able to even communicate with her. I tried to, and wasn't able to get through. She was, you know, reconditioned to want to stay. Uh, I had no access or uh, communication with my mother to Rosemary. Um, and for the entire time that she was there, 
Um, I was only able to see her one time, which was a time that she had gone back to visit my grandmother, her mother, uh, when she was sick. And I, and I just so happened to be in a situ in a position where I could come and actually visit. So I had just shown up unannounced and, uh, I gave her a hug and she's like, this was at her, at her, at her family's home. And, um, she tried to like play it cool but I also knew that I would be getting her in trouble if I really stayed. So I told her, Hey, I love you. I didn't bring up anything negative about Scientology. I tried to just keep everything very above boards at this time. I, I didn't understand a lot of the things that I know. And I'm kind of recounting now about the things with Ronnie and the things that we'll get into with the financial manipulation that she's going to be enduring. Um, but I thought that she was just in a religion she wanted to continue in and I didn't. So I didn't want to make waves for her. And, um, I kind of regret that, but, um, it's hindsight. And, uh, anyway, <laughs> this is what it is. You could have made things worse though, by, by really pushing and, you know, she might've dug her heels in. We don't know how humans are going to respond to things, but you're absolutely yeah. right that things get worse and worse. Tell me about September, 2011. What, what happened to your mom? Um, so I'm in the uh, United States military. I'm a helicopter pilot, and I was deployed in Afghanistan uh, in 2011. And I had gotten an email from my aunt that said that my mother was hospitalized. She had to have triple bypass surgery, and that she was going to be going into surgery within the next um, 24 to 48 hours. So I'm a, I'm a world away at this point. So I had gotten uh, authorization from my chain of command to leave theater early, and I, you know, traveled back planes, trains, and automobiles all the way back to the United States to to uh, Los Angeles, California, and it arrived the day after her surgery. Uh, her surgery went well. Um, she was being chaperoned by their medical liaison officers, which are their they they try to make it sound more like these people are actually medically trained. It's just somebody that's in charge of moving people to and from appointments, but they actually get the uh, powers of attorney for these people, so they're able to make medical decisions for them if they any Ugh. way they have control of them at this point. So those people are there, and uh, they're at the hospital. I I had called ahead uh, and told the organization I'm going to come. I know I'm a declared suppressive person. I don't care. My mother's in the hospital. I'm going to show up. I have no interest in creating any problems for you, but I'm going to be there for her. So I arrived, and um, I think they were not really sure what to do because normally they would move somebody if they knew a family member was coming and that family member was a suppressive person. But they couldn't. I mean, she's in the you know post-op um, intensive care unit, and she has to stay in the hospital at this point, so I was able to access her. Um, I went in there, was there with her while she recovered. Again, I kept everything very um, non-dramatic for her. I, I didn't uh, tell her about my disagreements with Scientology. I was supportive of her. And during that time, um, Scientology tried to get me to make nice with them, and they tried to get me through their steps to get me past uh, being a suppressive person. Huh. which these steps wow. basically mean you need to repent and say you're the bad one. And that's just not my personality. I'm not into, you know, rolling over and playing dead. So I tried to make nice with them. And I said, Hey, if you don't have any problem with me, I cannot have any problem with you. And we can just play nice. All I'd really like to do is be able to call and write to my mother and make sure that she's fine. And they were unwilling to, unless I became a Scientologist again. And I can honestly tell you, I would rather die than to be a Scientologist again. No doubt. Wow, I would yeah. I would rather deploy to any combat zone in the world than to spend another second in Scientology. And um, I can say that as a person that has deployed for five deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, that those I have less trauma from the military and everything that I've been through than the years that I was in Scientology as a child and then uh, through my 20s. That's incredible. Well, that just shows it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's – and when uh, – if I ever have a bad dream, it's not about anything combat related. It's about Scientology. <laughs> uh, I'll give you an example. I was, I was shot down in 2011 um, in Afghanistan. And we were able to land, got everyone out safely, made it back. But it was very traumatic. Uh, after we got everyone recovered and we were being debriefed, we were able to, you know, then finally, you know, hey, call it a day. Everyone go get some rest. That night was 
the craziest night's sleep that I've ever had. But you would think that I would have had nightmares about the the shoot down incident, making getting everyone recovered back in the middle of the night, massive fire explosions. I had dreams that I was back at the international base in Scientology working for David Miscavige. Like if you want to go at, like in terms of what that trauma dug up, it dug up stuff from my early childhood and from my twenties. Um, and that's really strange. Like I was like, I was really hoping to have a bad dream about the combat situation. And then I find myself back in Scientology. It kind of sucked. Um, but that's just how odd it was. And that's, that's where your, your mind is at and how, ultimately we were controlled and manipulated but um but what was strange about uh going back to now being with her and and again this is a couple months after that shoot down experience when i had come out of afghanistan to come and sit at her bedside i had not been back around scientology had anything to do with scientology been exposed to the people that i knew in scientology or any of the nomenclature or anything for about um, seven years at this point. Um, I just plucked myself out of it and completely went a different direction in my life. Going back into that was the most disorienting um, situation that I found myself in. When I was sitting down to talk with this person, Her was it was a, a person by the name of Mariam Pau. She was um, in Religious Technology Center they had to deal with me because I was formerly from the international base. And as we're sitting down to talk, I uh, was trying to talk to them about the situation, what was going on, the fact that I wanted to, you know, basically not, not have a beef with them, but just to be able to talk to my mother and how I hadn't had a chance to really process a lot of the trauma just because I had then left, but little things that she would say, I found were very manipulative immediately in my mind. It was almost hard to think for myself back in those situations again. I would disagree and just that they have one statement that Scientologists always say when you when you come up with something and you disagree in order to get that person back past the cos cognitive dissonance and it's what would Ron do or what would LRH say? Whenever you disagree with something, they reference you back to the information and the doctrine that they ingrain in you so heavily. And I was programmed to not ever think about anything other than that doctrine from the time I was 10 years old until I left when I was 27. So even though I had completely left and I'm, you know, seven, eight years later, and I'm now, um, you know, a helicopter pilot in the military, being back in that situation, I realized like this is super manipulative and it was traumatic to go back into it. So I you know, as they were trying to call me, I just stopped answering their phones. I stopped talking to them. I'm like, I can't deal with this at all. And, and, uh, they, they were over the next several months, they were trying to kind of get me back into it until I discovered what happened after my mother's surgery. Um, mm. like I said that, so I was, I was back for a very short leave again, being in the military and, my mother's there because she wants to be there. I think that she's in a church organization, though I can't stand them um, for what they were, but I wasn't trying to make a problem for her. And um, once she finished uh, in the intensive care unit, they moved her into a rehabilitation facility that uh, insurance had covered, but that only covered it for about a little, maybe two, two and a half weeks before she had to go back into living at Scientology. And this is that big blue building that has the big Scientology uh, word above it, you know, on L. Ron Hubbard Way in Los Angeles, yes. California. Yep. That's where she lived. So they moved her back there and um, she had no one taking care of her. So she had had the full, you know, sternum cracked open, heart surgery, and that the actual procedure to get to your heart is the thing that takes the, the most recovery because your whole chest is cracked open. She was kept in a room by herself. No one was taking care of her. She wasn't being brought food. There wasn't heat in this room. She was cold in there and she was just in there suffering. Her meds had run out. Like she, she thought she was going to die. And, um, every once in a while someone would come and check on her. And one of these medical assistants had come in and was talking to her and, um, and had mentioned that he had gotten some Scientology auditing. And, um, I'm sure a lot of your viewers know, but Scientology auditing is their, 
their spiritual processing that they provide their, uh, that help, is supposed to move a person towards greater spiritual enlightenment. They say it's going to handle all your physical problems, all your mental problems, give you these unbelievable abilities mentally. You know, it's, it's all just, you know, what they're, what they're trying to sell. But as a C organization member up till this point, she had never moved up Scientology's bridge to total freedom. Not at all. Right. And, this person mentioned, hey, I figured out a way to be able to get some of this auditing, which you would think would be provided to their staff as a matter of course. They're literally working almost for free around the clock. And um, and she's like, well, what? And he's like, well, we're able, I, we figured out a way we could just pay for it ourselves. So this is what, what they, a scheme that they had started. These elderly people in the United States, we have a program called Social Security. And I'm sure other companies, our, our countries have similar things. But for Social Security, when you get to the age of 65, you start getting a monthly pension uh, from the government. And as that money comes in, it's usually used by people normally in society to help cover their, their living expenses. It's usually not enough to cover everything, but it's supposed to help the person as sort of a retirement pension that's provided by the government for the years that you've paid into it. So as these uh, Social Security payments have been coming in, they've started to accumulate in her bank account. And this has been happening not only with her, but other elderly Sea Org members. Well, she was gotten to uh, one of their registrars, which are their fundraisers from one of those local organizations, came to her bedside and had her pay for over $10,000 of auditing, which is their their spiritual counseling, uh, that like as a staff member. So as a staff member, they're supposed to get this stuff as a matter of their contract. She really had never been provided it and thought this was really what she needed in order to save her from dying. And they just wow. took all of her money and just took it. And uh, then the, the auditing that she received once they cleaned her up and fed her and got her doing better was their assist auditing that people are supposed to be able to just do like with one another, which is like taking a person out for a walk and having them look at random things in the environment to make them feel better. And she got outside and she started feeling a little better once she got some fresh air and stuff like remarkable. Who would have thought to do such a thing if it wasn't for Scientology? That's what you get for $10,000. This this story is so remarkably bad. You think every time I, I'm yeah. going to tell you something, you're thinking like, oh my gosh, this is the absolute worst. But every every I'm going to keep expounding on what actually happened over the entire time that they had her, and it gets worse and worse and worse as this goes on. So at this time in 2011, uh, between 2011 and 2012 is when this all happened. And while I was out in California, I got her a burner phone, which is just one of the little prepaid phones. And I left it with her and I put my, um, my number inside of there so she could call me. And she had called me one day and she, this is what she told me. She's like, hi, Michael. I just wanted to let you know that I'm doing so much better. And I was genuinely happy for her. She's like, I'm starting to get auditing. I'm feeling better. I'm getting up and around. And I, I thought that this was great news. And it was. And I'm like, yeah, that's totally, that's totally wonderful. They, they also had not, um, one thing that Scientology didn't do was they did not pay the, um, the medical bills that she had. She's working for them and insurance paid a certain portion of the medical bills. They pay about 80%. Um, but then she was left to pay the rest of it. It was not paid by the organization. She was just left with that debt that she had to pay for out of her money. And for the organization, that's one of the things they claim they're going to provide a CERG member is medical expenses, dental, you know, going up the bridge to total freedom, all these things that you're supposed to get, you know, living, food, um, clothes. These are all the things they're supposed to provide, um, lodging, you, you name it. Well, they didn't cover her medical. She was stuck with that too. But as a result, she, she was also, she uh, was unable to qualify for the next level of um, insurance for medical insurance because she had had that $10,000 in her account. And she's like, well, I figured out a way to be able to get full insurance coverage, 100%, not just that 80%. And I, I'm, I'm starting to pay for my auditing myself. And I asked her, I'm like, wait, what did you say, mom? I'm like, you mean that they're not giving you auditing? Like, just because you're a Sea Org member, they're making you pay for it? And she said, yes, but don't say anything. I don't want to get, I don't want, you know, I don't want this to be problematic for me. She was, she knew it was wrong, but she wanted the auditing because she thought it would help her. And she knew she told me because I was a suppressive person, um, she would get in trouble. 
Um, this is kind of back to what would I do? I flipped out at this point. I was very, very upset. I got on the phone to these religious technology center people that were trying to like make nice with me and get me to acquiesce and be a Scientologist. And I, um, I explained to them what I thought about the situation, which is not fitting to share on YouTube without demonetizing this entire stream. Um, so yeah, it was bad. So I told them, I'm like, you're criminals. You're taking money from a person you should be taking care of. You should be ashamed of yourself. They're, they re the result in that was um, they pulled her in, they took her phone away, and they put her on, again, a course which is called the, uh, the Potential Trouble Source and Suppressive Person, How to Confront and Shatter Suppression, the PTSSP course. This is all of the indoctrination on what SPs are and how bad they are. They made her redo that training again. Um, you were after the I had SP. found because I was the SP. Yeah, like like obviously your son is complaining about you getting better because he's you know <laughs> up in arms about the fact that you're getting auditing. Factually, if it, if the if the auditing is what she wanted, I would have encouraged her to get it. The fact that I was pissed off had everything to do with the fact that they were taking her money for something they should have given her for free. And they weren't covering her medical expenses, and it was unconscionable. And I called them yeah. out on it, and they didn't like that. So needless to say, I lost contact with my mother um, again uh, from that point in 2011, 2012. And I then really did not have a chance to talk to her until um, she was pretty much on her deathbed in 2021. So right. I get, uh, I get a, uh, in 2021, many, many years pass at this point. Um, again, I get a, uh, a call from one of her brothers and sisters because Scientology will eventually reach out to family. She had been in the hospital for about two weeks at this point, And they had then told one of her, um, sisters, Hey, Rosemary is expected to pass away. We're just letting you know, we'll take care of all of the funeral expenses and everything. But we just want to tell you she's expected to die soon. She was at one of the hospitals right there in Hollywood. So hmm. my, um, my aunts and uncles called me, let me know. I flew out to California again and she was, uh, in Hollywood Presbyterian hospital, which is about a block and a half maximum away from their big complex in Hollywood. And this was during COVID, which travel was always fun, but getting into hospitals for anyone that's had the pleasure, um, I really feel for you because it, there's only certain visiting hours. You, you have to be all masked up, gowned up to come in and out of there. But I was able to go in and see her. The first day she was almost unresponsive and I was expecting for her to pass. And the second day um, they had her on IV antibiotics. I asked the doctor, I'm like, what's wrong with her? She's like, and he said, well, I think she had a stroke. Well, we're expecting her to die, but now that she, we're giving her fluids and she's resting and she's starting to improve slightly. So we're not exactly sure what, what happened. We're continuing to monitor her and run some tests. So after they got the test back, she didn't have a stroke. Um, they had worked her to the point where, and then this is kind of what you were alluding to. She had um, very bad pneumonia from the point that she had her heart surgery, she probably needed to have supplemental oxygen for many, many years and never had it. So her O2 saturation levels were tanking and she didn't have uh, oxygen. She didn't have a walker and she had really bad pneumonia and was working full schedules like 24 seven. Well, not 24 seven, but they, you, you start working at about eight o'clock in the morning and you work until about 10 o'clock at night, but seven days a week, every single day, those Sea Org members work, even their old people. And at this point, she's about 74 years old. Um, and she had basically been worked to death. So I had gone out there. I sat with her as many days as I could. Again, the medical liaison officers are all right in there. And one of the days, again, I showed up and I'm like, I'm not here to cause problems. I'm just here to be with my mom because I thought this would be the last time I would ever see her. And this was a chance for us to hopefully say our goodbyes, uh, to have some time together, um, and just to kind of put it all behind us. And then she started to slowly improve. Well, the, the third day that I was there, this medical liaison officer comes in. It was a lady by the name of uh, Barbell Light. Um, she's a German lady, but she, she works to take care of them medically. And she comes in to deliver um, a message from the senior 
auditor that they have in their church, which is the, they're called a case supervisor. This is the person that oversees all the person's Scientology counseling. And they had um, come in to basically authorize her to die. And they said, we have, uh, it's a lot of Scientology jargon, but I'll tell you exactly what she said. She said, Rosemary, I have a CS for you. And my mom said, okay. And she's like, uh, you have been authorized to drop your body. We will see you in 21 years. And my mom just said, okay. And, you know, the person kind of poked around a little bit more for a couple minutes. And I was just kind of sitting there witnessing all this. And I'm like, I, I wasn't even sure what to say. Um, but the inhumanity and in the way that they deal with human life is very, very strange. Uh, they They very much view the the life here and now is very temporary they mm. believe that they are all part of some big space cult and that they are going to be you know reborn and coming back to be sea org members lifetime after lifetime after lifetime it's it's really cruel but i suppose i suppose it's like one part of it's almost almost preferable because i think if i was dying and someone just very matter of factly said well look mate i'll see you in 21 years don't worry i'd be a bit more relaxed about it Do you know what i mean maybe that's where that mm -hmm. comes from Potentially. I mean, I think different religions have their way of dealing with death. You know, there's mm -hmm. people that some people believe that, you know, this here and now is all that there is. Other religions believe in some sort of afterlife. So there's different approaches to this. But even in Scientology, the, the general civilian Scientologist, not these Sea Org members that are more or less their military arm, but the civilian Scientologists believe that they will be reborn lifetime after lifetime. And the whole I would say one of the major goals of Scientology is to make it so you don't forget your past lives. I mean, there's something very alluring about that. If you could show up as yeah. a little kid with all of the information that you have now, um, mm -hmm. you would start buying Google stock immediately when you were like three years old, you know, and be very, very rich. Does it work that way that you, you get reborn back at the age that when Google was starting? Because I imagined that you'd be reborn. No, I was just saying, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> but what would you what would you know if it, the the Andrew Gold of today that you know everything like today that you, or you knew everything back when you were a child that you would know today, you would make a lot better decisions in life if you had the oh, full yeah. remembrance of your past life and everything about it. This is what Scientologists think. I will have full recall in my next lifetime. So the here and now, they very much like break it down where it doesn't matter very much. And the, mm -hmm. this, this one lifetime almost has very little meaning because you're going to have lifetime after lifetime. And if Scientology works for you, you'll have this full recall. And, I, you know, and, and seeing a person be authorized to die, that's kind of where my, my brain went. Like, this is really what they think. This is really that's what crazy. they think. Yeah. So yeah. well, and and yeah, well, it's a defense mechanism, I suppose, but mm -hmm. it, it causes so much harm, um, and things get even worse because I mean, how much did the amount of money they took from her? How much did that add up to? So once we once we found out all about what happened, um, so after the the incident that happened in 2011, they stopped taking her money in until 2014, and then they had all manner of schemes in place to keep harvesting money from her which is not unique just to her. And that's why I want to start whistleblowing on this. This is These are mm -hmm. schemes that have been in place for all of the elderly Sea Org members that are working in these organizations when they start to receive social security payments. They had had her donate what money that she had, this starting in um, a couple years out. So about 2017, they had her give $20,000 straight to the International Association of Scientologists. She was locked in a room with one of their commanding officers and made to give all the money she had. Once she had no oh money left, God. she was then sent to one of the organizations there and they were trying to get her to pay for more. And she's like, I work for you. I have no money. I've given you everything. I don't know what you want me to say. Like, I have nothing left. So their solution was to take another staff member who had a line of credit. He had a, um, because his family was independently wealthy, they ran up, uh, about fifty thousand uh, dollars on a credit card in this other person's name, like on this other person's credit card without their authorization. And then when the person's like, "What did you do to my card?" They said, "It's for Rosemary. She needs to pay you back." So then she spends the next four or five years chipping away at this, using her retirement pension to pay this person back. They had done that same thing with three different people. 
on running up their credit cards and making her then pay them back. And now she's not <laughs> only trying to on in the in the little amount she gets for Social Security, which is just barely over a thousand dollars. Um maybe a thousand pounds is what it would be per month. And that would be it. And then she's slowly trying to pay off this debt, but then the debt's not only compounding due to interest, but then they're running up other debts from other people. And then when that scheme, they started running out of other people's credit cards, they started falsifying because these Sea Org members, they have all of their information. They have their birth, they have their date of birth, they have their social security numbers, they have their mother's maiden name, they have all of the information that the person would have. So they started opening up credit cards in her name to the tune of twenty, thirty thousand dollars a pop. And then as soon as those credit cards would be opened, they'd again pay for services uh, for going up the bridge to total freedom. All things she should get for free. Um, yeah. What is so crazy about all of this is uh, just this would just be happening over and over again. And she had become almost apathetic about it. Didn't even know what to do. She had no contact with her family anymore. And it was just happening to her. And she thought if she didn't pay off these bills, she was going to get into trouble with the organization. So even the $50 a month that they, or sorry, $50 a week is what Sea Org members get paid. So less than $200 a month, that would all go into these bills. And the, the insidious nature of, of the way these credit card schemes work is if they're doing it to old people, old people that have major medical conditions, old people that are expected to pass away, old people that they're authorizing to die, with medical bills. If you think about it, just go back to this. Usually credit card bill is secured loan, meaning if you have $50,000 in credit card debt, when you die, the creditors get the first crack at your assets that you have. If you have a house, if you have a car, they take it all. But Sierg members have nothing. So these banks that are being lied to and being told that these people have assets that they don't, if they pass away, the banks eat the loss and Scientology ends up just walking with the money. This is not unique to my mother, Rosemary. This was done to dozens and dozens of old people at that uh, Hollywood complex that she knows just in that one location. And she's isolated to that one location in Hollywood. They have other locations, and this has been an issue um, that they've, they've been getting their money in this way. And it's all just trying to get the statistics up. That's what these Sea Org members are fanatical about it because they'll get in trouble week by week if they don't make more this week than they did last week. It's it's very, very strange. Scam. Absolute scam. Yeah. And it's so sad. They prey on the vulnerable and they prey on people who, who don't know and they don't know what's happening to them. It's so sad. And then there was this letter. Tell me about the letter she sent to Tom Cruise and David Miscavige. Uh, because your mother, you know, she's been abused at this point beyond belief for decades. And she writes for the first time in 35 years that she's free. And it's so beautiful to read that. I mean, how does that make you feel that Scientology took so much from her? Uh, a bit furious um, when when she was in the hospital we were expecting her to pass away she and I had said our goodbyes we you know she had gotten a little bit better but we were, I was still expecting her to, to pass and I couldn't I couldn't live in Los Angeles in a hotel room indefinitely so you know the medical officers were there I you know at some point I had to go back to my job um, but uh, over the course of the next year, she was put into a hospice facility. She was provided oxygen. Um, she was kept off of their main complex, their compound, not because they needed to put her in, an, in a rest home because they cared about her, but because they were scared to keep her on their premises. If she would die on the premises, they would have to call emergency medical services to enter their premises and see how their people live, which yeah. we're talking about old people sleeping on bunk beds. Like... In their elderly people that are that are jammed into a big room, some of them sleeping on a top bunk, that that are probably in their 80s and 90s. Um, this is how their people are living, working and not not well taken care of. So when she was in this hospice facility, she had reached out to me just to be in contact, and she wasn't sharing the fact that she was talking with me. But I was slowly able to start sharing uh, a lot of the Scientology documentaries that have been done and are available on the internet with her at the rate she was able to consume them and no one was watching her. So because of that, she was able to slowly deprogram. She was able to watch Going Clear, able to watch a lot of the uh, the Leah Remini, Mike Rinder uh, documentaries on Scientology in the aftermath, 
started listening to podcasts. These are all people she worked with on a lot of these things. She knew most of the people that were in these videos. And um, I have to touch on this, and then we'll definitely talk about the Tom Cruise letter. Uh, the thing that broke the camel's back was not um, Scientology in the aftermath, hearing about other people's trauma, hearing about other people's experiences the same way, because she was still in her mind was convinced that L. Ron Hubbard was still a good person. So she thought that like it was just David Miscavige. It's just this current regime that's doing these wrong things. Hubbard will somehow, you know, it'll all be better once we, in the future, it'll change back. When she watched the documentary Going Clear from, um, from Lawrence Wright, Going Clear is Scientology and the Prison of Belief. That was the thing. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. She realized what a fraud Hubbard was at that point. And then she was like, I got to get out of here. But at this point, she's an elderly old woman on oxygen that can barely get around. And now it's like, how do you get a person moved at this point? So very sneakily, we figured out bit by bit, I was able to get legal documentation in place to have her sign up, you know, give me uh, power of attorney to get it set up with her doctors that she was okay to travel, get her set up with oxygen. Uh, the Aftermath Foundation was instrumental in helping us with this uh, to provide us the monetary assistance that we needed in order to move her and put her into a good facility. Um, but we, it was, it was quite cloak and dagger, but we ended up actually getting her out of there quickly, getting to the airport and getting her free. And what a bit of poetic justice, the, the two people that helped me, uh, to physically move her was Justin Tompkins, also known as Justin Miscavige, my best friend when I was growing up, uh, and Roan Horwich, L. Ron Hubbard's granddaughter. So I had a Hubbard and a Miscavige that helped spring <laughs> my mother out of the facility and actually get her to safety. So, and she's out of there now. But when, when she got out, there was still a lot of, a lot coming off, a lot of, um, a lot of trauma that we had to help her get through. And as part of this, she felt like she wanted to officially, um, highlight things in Scientology that need, uh, the need fixed things that they, there has to be. Uh, the chance for Scientology to hopefully reform. And she wanted to take the, uh, the, the high road and to outline things that she saw that need to improve. And she wrote a formal uh, letter to David Miscavige and also to Tom Cruise, who is Scientology's big spokesperson, who has, you know, um, backed them financially and in the media year after year after year, specifically calling for improvements and saying, I would like these things to improve, not for her, but for the people that are still there. And um, I think the letter that she wrote speaks a lot because it's not asking, other than she's saying, please don't harass me in this letter. She's asking for reform for those who are still stuck in the situation that she previously was in. You don't really think, I imagine, that Tom Cruise, or probably not David Miscavige either, but that Tom Cruise will read it, do you? We sent it to his agent. So I don't know how to get a letter to Tom Cruise exactly, but his agent that handles all of his things, it was sent directly to him. So the letters that were sent directly to David Miscavige, we sent them to the known addresses of David Miscavige. They were all returned to sender. He's, he's, a, he's evading service in multiple lawsuits, so that wasn't a big surprise. But the one for Tom Cruise never came back. So it most definitely arrived uh, with his agent. It arrived uh, to the person that should be handling his affairs of correspondence coming inbound. And um, I don't know if, if Tom Cruise would ever see it, but I do know that if Tom Cruise took the time to read it and to internalize it and really try to look at what's going on, no matter how indoctrinated he is, it would be hard for him to not be responsible enough to um, address some of the things that she talks about in this, because these are all basic human rights violations. There's nothing very esoteric about any of these things. They're all things that she has uh, ad addressed specifically that need to be changed, such as um, separating families, um, women being forced to terminate pregnancies, uh, not being able to stay in contact with loved ones because they have different religious views or they want to leave the organization. Um, what else does she go? I'm just kind of looking at these things. Oh, the Rehabilitation Project Force, the way that people are treated 
so terribly bad when they fall out of favor with the organization where they're they're quite literally treated like they are uh, refugees in North Korea that have fallen out of favor with the regime there. That is what the Re Rehabilitation Project Force is like. She started recounting the stories of the way that she lived in there, and I mean, it's inhumane. Um, and then also not giving medical care to seniors. There's a lot of old people that are not being properly taken care of, and she's saying they need to be. They need to be stop working them to death. If Scientology is so, so great, provide them the benefits of Scientology, but stop using them like, like slave labor. Tom, Tom knows a lot of this, doesn't he? And I, I don't think he very much cares. From my understanding, um, because I work to the highest levels of Scientology as well, Tom Cruise and David Miscavige are very closely connected. And if there's anyone that, that David Miscavige confides in more than anyone else, um, probably either in the C organization or outside of the C organization, it's Tom Cruise. So, but does he want his name connected with things that are, you know, people that are coming out and whistleblowing? Does he want, she, she kind of gave him an out in here saying, hey, he, you can be the big hero to fix this stuff if you want to. And that's even, and she was trying to kind of massage his humanity and, you know, also his ego of which I think that's astronomical in size. Like, hey, can you make this stuff um, better? Because Scientology in their numbers is declining rapidly from, and if it wasn't from very um, wealthy religious donors uh, or, you know, they, they probably wouldn't have enough money to continue to survive. So that's only going to last for so long. But if they really want to share Scientology with the world, there's going to have to be reform. And there's been reform in other religions to a certain degree where the society has said, this is not okay. It has to change. Um, so are we calling for the abolishment of Scientology? No, we're, I think that Scientology needs to be made to reform and it needs to be held accountable for the things that they do wrong, as any religion or organization needs to. And right now they're hiding behind a lot of religious protections that are provided to them by the Constitution. And mm -hmm. they, they should, if a person has been mistreated, not have this out where they're able to hide behind the courts and hide behind the First Amendment protections that were actually created in the first place to protect individuals. And now this massive corporation is the one being protected. So we'd like to see that different. Cruz was just spotted uh, the other day, at, like that British um, big ceremony, the first one in years. He's just like jetted in. Well, I don't know if you jet on a helicopter. He choppered in and uh, he's sitting there milling around, shaking hands, taking photos. He must be aware of all of this abuse isn't it crazy that like mr hollywood like the big hollywood star that everybody loves might actually be something of a psychopath um he i would say he's definitely complicit uh he, i don't know what rock you have to be living under at this point to not understand mm -hmm. that scientology has a lot of dirt connected to it there's been so many people that have spoken out that have uh, shared their abuses in specific situations and stories that are in very close alignment with one another. Um, it's hard to ignore it. Like all these people who are geographically separated and that have nothing to do with one another now that they've left Scientology, they want to start speaking out and sharing their stories and they line up perfectly. So, mm. so if a person doesn't uh, take the time to really notice these things, he either has his information so tightly controlled which he's the one that's deciding that that's the case, or he sees it all and he just simply does not care. Um, either one of those things I think are terrifying, but at the end of the day, like we're talking about somebody who has hundreds of millions of dollars at his disposal. He, if he woke up one day and say, hey, I want something different, he could quite literally pick up the phone and tell Dave, hey Dave, this stuff needs to change immediately and you need to address mm -hmm. this directly or else. And I think an or else from Tom Cruise might be one of the biggest things could Im that it could impact Scientology, not only because his buddy Dave is in charge of it, but because they have so much to lose if he would put pressure on them. So as gimmicky as it sounds to add Tom Cruise to the, the, uh, the actual title of this, when we were talking about it, like who else, like what other celebrity has the clout um, and the control and the access that he has? No one else does. So that's why we're like, we, we discussed it a little bit, like, does this sound, does this sound like too much? And we're like, well, he's the one putting himself out there, representing himself as the most important Scientologist that has ever lived. So let's give him the opportunity to do something about it, of which he has not yet answered the letter, which is not a big shock. But um, in the, in the last part of the letter, 
Um, she says she provides an opportunity for them to reach out to her. Um, she says uh, right here, I want to make sure that you get this letter so that you can make the changes requested. By August 24th, please send me an email to the following address, and she provides an email that they can uh, they can send to her, which should be fairly, fairly convenient, confirming that you have received this letter. If I don't hear from you by then, I will find another way to ensure that you receive it so that you can help me and others. So at this point, we're just trying to share it. Maybe Tom Cruise didn't get the letter because his uh, agent didn't provide it. Um, so I'd like to try to share it in other ways. So we'll, uh, we're now mm. exploring those avenues. Well, Mr. Cruz, if you're watching, we'd like to talk to you, but I've got a feeling you don't want to talk to us. Um, Mike, where can people find your channel? I have created a YouTube channel. It's at Mike Brown 101 on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it is a culmination of is my story is slowly making its way into there, but I'm trying to create a repository specifically for my mother's stories and uh, to go over the specifics on what she's dealt with uh, in and around the sea organization so please if you uh, are interested uh, give it a look guys mike has been through a lot his mother has been through even more so please do give him some support go over to his channel you can just type mike brown scientology as well that will find him as well go over and subscribe uh, please hit the like button as well on this get this video out there because more people do need to see it and keep on watching this channel